Hey guys, Constance here from Cosplot and Cornbread. So I'm going to do a little bit of a... Hmm... I guess we'll just call this a coffee chat because while it is a little bit of a devotional, it's also a little bit of a conversation about a few other things as well. I um, have something I've been wanting to talk about and I've kind of been putting it off, but last night I woke up at one o'clock in the morning and this was just laid on my heart and I tossed and turned and tossed and turned and I couldn't get this out of my head and so finally at about three o'clock in the morning I'm like, okay Lord, I will talk about that. And then I was able to finally go back to sleep. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, in this video, I'm not going to monetize it because it, I guess it could possibly get flagged over what I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, it, it's funny because sometimes people, channels can talk about this stuff and it's no problem. Other times it isn't. So I'm just going to not monetize this video and I'm going to moderate the comments just to be on the safe side. And uh, yeah, so... Whew. Okay. So I am going to talk about some of the things that have been going on in our country. First of all, I want to say that as an American citizen, I am grieved over the things that I see happening. It grieves me. It grieves me to see people being silenced, to see people being attacked, to see all of these things that are happening. You know, I, I'm i someone who raised my right hand and I took the oath of enlistment myself. My husband made a career of active duty army life. Most of my friends were, were military at some point. I've attended the funerals of friends who died in the service of this nation to defend our freedoms. So it grieves me to see what is happening as an American citizen. We are seeing people being silenced and it's unreal. It's it's almost, it's hard to fathom here in our country. Um, silencing your enemy is not a good thing. I am a free speech absolutist and I will tell you why. First of all, if your neighbor is a hate-filled, horrible human being, wouldn't you rather know that so that you can steer clear of them as opposed to them just keeping it to themselves and, I don't know, them doing you harm later on? I would like to know if my neighbor is a horrible person because I want them to feel free to speak about whatever they want to speak about. I did a video a while back about uh, the importance of being able to disagree with people and why it's okay to talk to people who don't see eye to eye with you, that it's actually a really good thing. I will put a link down below to that video if you're interested in it. I was out on the tractor mowing and it just kind of like downloaded into my brain and I had to get off my tractor and go out on the porch covered in sweat and filth and dirt and get it out. It is important to be able to disagree with people. It's, it's how good things come out of that, you guys. But we're seeing people being silenced. Now, there's the argument, well, they're private businesses, they can do what they want. No, that's not actually true. We are seeing a merging of private business with the government. They are working hand in hand. And if you don't believe me, look at who some of these people are on their boards, okay? You've got big tech people. Actually, there's big tech people on being put into cabinet positions 
in the incoming administration. Um, and there's a slew of government people who are sitting on the boards of these big tech companies. So this is a merging of the two. This isn't just private businesses making decisions for themselves. It's not. And even if it was, when it is the public square where people freely express themselves, the Constitution actually overrides that. And if you don't believe me, there was actually a case, I believe it was called Marsh versus Alabama back in the day. And they even said when private business uh, and the Constitution collide, the Constitution must always win. So just there's a little history lesson, a little civics lesson. Go look up that case if you don't believe me. Private business big tech merging with government is not a good thing. And here's another little nugget for you. If you want to get a very good understanding of why it is dangerous, there is a book called IBM and the Holocaust. Look it up, read it, and you'll see very clearly why the merging of big tech and government is a horrifying thing. I expressed concern the other day about having my voice shut down, taken away. And I had a couple people make comments in regards to, well, if you're not calling for violence, you'll be fine. Please hear my heart. I believe that is a naive um, opinion because right now you don't have to be calling for violence to be silenced. You just have to disagree with those in power. And I don't believe, and while right now this is political speech, not violent speech, just political speech that is being silenced, I don't think it's gonna stop there. Folks, it isn't gonna stop with political speech because I firmly believe that faith and religion will be the next thing to be silenced. If you look at history, when we were America, the, the colonies were under the rule, the tyrannical rule of King George, and we were wanting to fight back and gain our freedom. Where did that start? It started in the churches. They were called the Black Robe Regiment. It was the churches that led the charge to fight for freedom. So I don't think, I, it's, it's not going to stop with political enemies, folks. And I don't think it's going to stop with speech. I've been saying for a while, um, talking with friends that uh, finances are going to start being affected. People won't be able to do business People won't be able to support themselves. Their livelihoods will be taken away. I've been saying that for a while, and this week we've kind of started seeing that. And you, and folks, that's not a new thing. A while back, I did a Bible study that uh, went into history of the early church. And this is the workbook that was with it. It was called In the Dust of the Rabbi. And it explained uh, the, the culture in the early church and what the early, early Christians, early believers were facing when, <laughs> when they chose to follow the Messiah. And one of the things that really, really stood out to me was where they were walking through an ancient marketplace. And in that marketplace, they explained that in order to do any kind of business in the cities, and remember these cities were pagan, okay? They were under pagan rule. In order for anybody to do business in these cities, in the marketplace, to sell or buy goods, they had to be willing to make a sacrifice to the god of that market, of that city, their patron god, I guess you could say. So Christians, 
in order to buy and sell goods in that city would have to be willing to defy God and participate in pagan worship. But they couldn't do that. You couldn't do that if you were a believer. These marketplaces not only were for commerce, but it was also where the government was, was kind of uh, centered, where the city leaders would be. If you wanted to participate in society, you had to bend the knee and participate in the idolatry of that society. So Christians, believers, began creating their own culture, their own society, living among the pagans, but separate. Folks, financial institutions are coming against people who have conservative values, who have Christian values, and I really believe that it's probably going to get worse. I think that what the early church saw is an example of what we are going to be seeing. You know, I've been talking for a while now about how the battle that we are facing, the battle that we are seeing, this is a spiritual battle. Even within our government, this is a spiritual battle. We are facing Marxism, communism, socialism, all of the isms, and they are all branches of the same evil tree. And if you do not believe this is an evil that we are facing, there is a book, another book suggestion for you, called The Devil and Karl Marx. If you don't think Marxism is evil, you need to read that book. Uh, it's even available as an audiobook. You can download it, you can listen to it. When you understand the origins of Marxism, it is... <laughs> you cannot get any clearer that this is actually a battle between good and evil. Now, a lot of times when... Now, here's one of the things that... I've not really wanted to talk about, but i it's impressed upon me that I need to. I've had a lot of people say when I bring up topics like this, that God will save our country, that God will not allow evil to win. God is going to save us. My question in response would be, why? Why exactly would God save America? You know, George Washington prayed that as long as America was good, God would bless it. But he also said that if America ever turned evil and turned away from God, that God should take his hand of protection away. That was at our foundations. That was at the foundation, the beginning of this nation, folks. Over the past several months, I, I have been diving into the Bible more than ever. And the last couple months, I have found myself really drawn to the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. And there is a theme that I keep coming across over and over and over and over again. And it is the reason I say, why? Why should God save America? This is going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but in Deuteronomy, chapters 19, chapter 21, God talks about how he hates the shedding of innocent blood. Isaiah 59, verse 7, God is listing off the sins of the nation. It says, Their feet run to evil. They rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of wickedness. Their paths lead to havoc and ruin. 
the way of peace they do not know. Their goings about obey no law. They make devious paths for themselves. No one treading them will ever know peace. That is Isaiah 59 verses 7 and 8. Jeremiah chapter 19 verses 3 and 4. Say, I am about to bring disaster on this place that will make the ears of whoever hear about it ring. This is because they have abandoned me and alienated this place. In it they have offered to other gods that neither they nor their ancestors have known, nor the kings of Judah. They have filled this place with the blood of innocent people. Psalm 106, yes, they shed innocent blood, the blood of their own sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to Canaan's false gods, polluting the land with blood. Thus they were defiled by their deeds. They prostituted themselves by their actions. For this Adonai's fury blazed up against his people, and he detested his heritage. He handed them over to the power of the nations, and those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they kept them in subjection to their power. Proverbs 6. There are six things Adonai hates, seven which he detests, a haughty look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. There's many scriptures that carry that same thought. Folks, our nation legalized the shedding of innocent blood in, I believe it was 1972. A few years ago, that was expanded. It was celebrated. We lit up a tower in New York City with colors to celebrate it. I don't think you can get much more innocent than the blood of the unborn. And our nation our nation celebrates it as a choice, as a right. Millions upon millions have lost their lives that way. I don't know how God allows a nation to stand. A nation that does that and celebrates it. And, you know, God doesn't have to punish a nation for that. It's over and over and over again, when God's people turn their back on God, do wicked things, God just simply takes his hand of protection away. Every time they fall into the hands of their enemies, they realize that they have sinned. They turn back to God. They repent of their sins. And then God has mercy on them. And eventually, he helps them get their freedom again. But that pattern happens over and over again. All he has to do is to take away his hand of protection. I think it is very clear right now that we have enemies of this nation, enemies of truth, within and without. It looks like we are falling into the hands of the enemies of truth and righteousness. We are being, as a nation, we're being provoked. People who want good for our country are being tested, are being provoked. You guys, there are very powerful people and there's a lot of them and they want us to get violent. They want us to snap. There are flyers going around about a, an armed protest that's supposed to be happening all over the country, like in all 50 states or something like this. Folks, 
I'm telling you with every fiber of my being, I feel like that is a setup. Don't go. If you are thinking about doing it, if you know, buddy, if you know somebody who is thinking about going to one of these protests, please do everything in your power to stop them. An armed protest is not going to be a good thing. It's not going to end well. It is, it is a provocation. They are taking away freedom of speech and something happening, all it takes is one person and they will just have every bit and pardon the pun, every bit of ammunition that they need to shred the Second Amendment. Shred it. And people will back them up for doing it. They'll have every excuse here in the country and I'm sure that globally other nations will look, oh yes, that is an uprising, that is a violent uprising. The new U.S. government has every right to stop that. Folks, it is a setup. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's people who want violence, they want conflict. Don't give it to them. Don't give it to them. They are describing people who have conservative values, who value the Constitution. They're describing them as a sickness that needs to be cleansed. That is terrifying language, and that is the language that is being used. Remember what I said. This is a battle of good and evil. This is a spiritual battle. Your spiritual armor is your number one tool. Prayer, the word, you have got to ground yourself in your faith. Ground yourself, rooted, rooted in the word that you will not be moved. You will not be provoked by the enemy of your soul. Every year around the beginning of the year or the end, looking into the next year, a lot of times people will come up with what their theme word will be, I guess, their, their theme of the year, their, their motto, their whatever you want to call it. I keep coming to one word for 2021, and that is courage. We are going to need courage to stand against the enemy and to stand with what is right and what is true because it will be very tempting to fall into that trap. I talked throughout the year in several of the devotional types of videos that I have done. I have kind of hinted at a sense of, and sometimes I've talked about it directly, but I've, I've, I've mentioned the sense of a storm coming and how, you know, you, you can see the dark clouds on the horizon and you know you need to prepare and prepare no matter what, you know, Prayerfully, maybe that storm will dissipate before it arrives, but maybe it won't. But you should be prepared either way. Folks, I feel like that storm has gotten so close that you can feel the electricity in the air. It's like we're walking around with bated breath just waiting for the first lightning bolt to strike. In all practicality, if there is a storm coming, it is important to be prepared. Be prepared physically. In other words, have some extra food on hand. You know, I think this year has been a great example of why it's important to have a stocked pantry as best that you can. You know, I was sick and I couldn't leave my house. And if your entire family ends up having to quarantine and you have an empty pantry and maybe you don't have anybody who can bring you food, Having that full pantry is a lifesaver. Being able to just open up your freezer or open up a canning jar full of something and having food to eat on hand without having to leave, it's vital. Get as much food as you can to store away just in case. Because if things get crazy in our country, if you look historically, violence, things like that didn't happen everywhere. But what did affect everyone was the supply chain. 
the disruptions in the supply chain, trucks and shipments not being able to get where they were going. So it's important to have a full pantry. It's important to have extra medication on hand. Make sure your first aid kit is stocked and full. Any kind of medications that you might need. Um, your gas. You should look at your gas tank being half as empty. Don't let your gas tank get below half full. As soon as you get to half, fill it right back up again. Half is the new empty. Have a talk with your family. Make a plan that if something happens, what you'll do. Communication. I was talking with a friend the other day about how, you know, they're shutting down people on platforms. So alternate platforms are being created and you have alternate sources of getting the information that you need. And I said that my prediction was, I think they'll start using the internet itself. If the internet company that you have doesn't allow you to go to a website, then it doesn't matter how many sources of information are out there, how many alternate platforms are out there, how many places there are for you to connect with the people that you need to. If you can't get on those websites, if your internet service does kind of like a Barracuda uh, web filter and they don't let you go there, you're cut off. The very next day there was a story about an internet company in Idaho that decided it wasn't allowing any of its customers to access Twitter or Facebook. And while a lot of people thought, you know, well, that's pretty funny, it was exactly what I was saying. Okay, they're blocking Facebook and Twitter, so um, how about that's going to give people ideas and they're going to start blocking everything else? There's also a historian that I was listening to uh, talking the other day um, and he mentioned he believes that there will come a time where that not only will big tech silence voices but that we will but that we will actually lose our ability to use cell phones um, so have a plan with your family if you lose all technical means of communication, have a plan of what you will do in that event. I am not going to stop talking about my faith and about my beliefs, and I've made that very clear in many of my videos. I'm going to keep talking as long, as long as I can, because I just think that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And if something happens and this platform is taken down, I'll tell you right now, I will just keep joining platforms on, as long as I can until I don't have the ability to do so. But if this one is taken away, every platform that is out there, you will either be able to find me as Cosmopolitan Cornbread or you will be able to find me as God Guns and Coffee, like my tank top that I often wear says and I have joined a couple places using that name and basically whichever name I use is according to my mood that day but you will be able to find me as one of those until the day if and when that time comes that I don't have the ability to do so so I just want to put that out there I'm not gonna keep I'm not gonna keep quiet I'm not gonna stop talking I'm going to continue to encourage people. So I want to reiterate, do not seek conflict. Do not seek to go after and, and cause problems with other people, with people that you disagree with. Do not be provoked to violence. That is what the enemy wants. Matthew chapter 5 verse 5 says, how blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Now the word meek, people, people think that that's like a little mouse, that that's what meek is, shrinking violet. That's not what the word meek means. The word meek implies someone with a lot of power 
who does not wield it against others. You have the power, you have the ability to do things, but you restrain. How blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will seek God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We are supposed to be the peacemakers. We're supposed to be the keep peacekeepers. We are not supposed to pursue violence. We are not supposed to look for that conflict. We will be known by our fruit. Make sure your fruit is that of godliness, holiness, kindness, patience, long-suffering, mercy, humility. I hope to God that things don't get bad here in our country. But as someone who studies history and sees patterns repeating, I am not... I don't want to say I'm not optimistic, but I'm a little realistic and we need to be prepared if things get rough I don't want you losing faith I don't want you losing hope when things get bad when things get terrible when everything looks dark and hopeless I want you to think about this in Luke chapter 21 Jesus is talking about how bad the world is going to get how awful things are going to be the wickedness, the, the earthquakes, the, the wars, the fighting, the conflict. But you know what he says in verse 14? Make up your mind not to worry. Make up your mind not to worry. I'm, I'm sad about what I see happening in our country but I am not afraid of what is to come. It could get very unpleasant, but I'm not afraid. You know, no matter what happens here in America, yes, I'm an American citizen, but I've also got dual citizenship. And if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, a child of God, you have dual citizenship as well. At the end of every one of my videos, I have a scripture reference, and it is in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. For we have no permanent city here. On the contrary, we seek the one that is to come. All throughout history, nations rise and fall. Peoples rise and fall. Kingdoms rise and fall. They come and go. But what does not go away is God's kingdom. Your citizenship in God's kingdom does not go away. And we need to be focused on that. And we need to remember that no matter what, no matter what it is why i'm emphasizing being grounded in his word being being just wrapped in prayer and faith and not allowing any of this mess to move you from that like i said i've been spending a lot of time in the old testament and in the prophets and seeing these things happening over and over and over again and lately there's an old song that has been coming to mind a lot, and I just want you to listen to these lyrics. I'm just a poor, wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more, no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan I'm only going over home. I know dark clouds will gather around me. I know my way is rough and steep, but golden fields lie just before me where God's redeemed shall ever sleep. 
I'm going home to see my mother and all my loved ones who've gone on. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I'll soon be free from every trial, my body sleep in the churchyard. I'll drop the cross of self-denial and enter on my great reward. I'm going there to see my Savior, to sing his praise forevermore. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. If you are a believer, you live here, but this is not your home. Remember, you have that dual citizenship. And even if, even if the worst happens and America falls to its enemies, it does not mean that God has abandoned you. It does not mean that God has walked away from you. When King Solomon built the temple and it was completed, he dedicated it with countless sacrifices and praise and worship and prayer and what was supposed to be seven days ended up being 14 days of celebrations. But I want you to listen to this one portion of his prayer in the dedication of the temple. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse beginning in verse 46. Again, this is the dedication of the temple, and he's talking about the people of Israel. If they sin against you, for there is no one who doesn't sin, and you are angry with them, and hand them over to the enemy, so that they carry them off captive to the land of their enemy, whether far away or nearby, then if they come to their senses in the land where they have been carried away captive, turn back and make a plea to you in the land of those who carried them off captive, saying, We sinned, we acted wrongly, we behaved wickedly. If in the land of their enemies who carried them off captive, they return to you with all their heart and being, and pray to you toward their own land, which you gave to their ancestors, toward the city you chose, and toward the house I have built for your name. Then in heaven, where you live, hear their prayer and plea, uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive their transgressions, which they have committed against you, and give them compassion in the sight of their captors, so that they will show compassion toward them. For they are your people, your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the flames of the iron furnace. I read you that scripture because it just shows you that no matter where you are, no matter what the circumstances, even if you are taken by your captors, if you remain faithful to God, He is with you and He will hear you. We see examples of that over and over and over in Scripture. We see Daniel who was taken captive when Israel fell to its enemies. And he was used mightily by God, mightily by God, while in captivity while in the service of the pagan king. Even he remained faithful, even if it meant being thrown into a pit of hungry lions, he didn't waver. Neither did his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were faithful to God, even to be thrown into a furnace, which he touched on there. And God worked miracles, and God saved them no matter what happens and <laughs> i hope to god i hope to god the storm to dissipates but if it does not remain grounded in the word remain faithful to the lord don't be swayed left or right do not be moved Because those who serve God and those who remain faithful to God, God 
never leaves you. Please do not think that if things get bad in America, that that means it's time for the rapture and we're going to be ripped out of here. Looking back through history, there are many times when things got really, 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 really bad. It wasn't happening yet. And if we think persecution comes to America and that means that it's time for the rapture, then what about all of those Christians? What about all those believers in all the other countries in the world who are currently suffering, being arrested, being thrown into prison, who are being killed for their faith? Folks, America's not, folks, we're not special. And if they're not saved, but we think we are supposed to be, how weak are we? How weak are we as believers? Make sure you are grounded, unmoving, faithful to the Lord. Like I said, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a prophet. God hasn't given me foresight into what is coming here in our country. I just know what I see. I know history and I'm concerned. I'm concerned as an American. I'm concerned as a believer. I don't like, I don't like the patterns I see being repeated, but that ultimately, no matter what happens, we always need to remember that our faith, our faithfulness, ultimately our relationship with the Lord is above all more important than anything that is happening around us, that is happening in our country, in our government, or anywhere else. Stay faithful to the Lord. And if you do not have a sure, a sure relationship with Him, Today is the day. Today is the day to seek Him, to ask Him to forgive you of your sins because as Solomon said, there is no one who doesn't sin. Seek God's face and make your calling and election sure today. We're not promised tomorrow. Whether things get bad in our nation or there's a car accident or you catch a virus, we're not promised tomorrow. Don't waste, don't waste another day. So that is all I have to say for today. I don't really have a planned way of wrapping this up, but um, thank you for joining me here for this coffee chat of sorts. My name is Constance from Cosmopolitan Cornbread, and I'll talk to you all next time.